Thanks, Palmer. Uh, maybe stand back. I don't know what it is about the sound. But it was my plan this morning to put anthrotoxigenic E. coli in the food that you all ate this morning. <laughs> but Dean Ness said, while it would get audience participation, it wasn't public health. So, uh, so we, we decided not to do that. Um, but I would like to take you uh, on a trip and see what happens when we, uh, uh, when we are exposed to unhygienic conditions. In, soon after I arrived in Houston in the early 70s, uh, from Baltimore, very interested in diarrheal diseases, we did what Sutton, Willie Sutton did. If you're going to rob banks, you're going to find money. And if you go to Mexico, you're going to find diarrhea. So we moved to Mexico, and we established a, a setting of research where college students go to various cities of Mexico, and they become our subjects, and we followed them during the time that they were there for the illness that they inevitably developed. As I've said, there are a few things in life as predictable as the rate of diarrhea among people going to Mexico from this country. And over the years, we uh, learned that that was the case. Uh, we've taken students from this school and from medical schools with us uh, uh, to work on these projects, and I think they've benefited by the international experience. I want to describe the problem of traveler's diarrhea to you, just tell you what it does. I want to um, give you some very brief, uh, give you a brief glimpse of what we're doing to prevent this problem. We are very close to the point where I think we can prevent it in most people who travel. Uh, and I want to indicate how, we're going to, how we do that. Okay, now, 100 million people travel each year to tropical and semi-tropical areas of the world. 40% of those people get traveler's diarrhea. There are 40 million cases of this disease per year. Uh, the, we used to think, well, the big problem of traveler's diarrhea is the 24 hours of total disability, which is what we found uh, uh, occurs when traveler's diarrhea occurs, whether it's in Brazil or whether it's in Asia or Africa or Latin America, Mexico. It's one day of disability, total decked. Uh, put to bed for a day. We thought that was the problem. And that was a big problem because if you go somewhere for six days and one day you're in bed and two or three days you don't feel right, the trip is wrecked. But when I was introduced in 2003 to give the keynote address at the British Society of Gastroenterology meeting, the guy that introduced me said, this guy knows more about traveler's diarrhea than any, anybody in the world, but he doesn't follow his people long enough to know the real impact of the problem. I looked at him, I said, Robin, is that a good introduction in the UK? <laughs> it, it didn't sound so good to me. A anyway, he got my attention, and we began to look at the long-term effect of this illness. And what we found and others have found is that between 5 and 10 percent of people who develop traveler's diarrhea develop uh, uh, post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, which looks identical to idiopathic IBS, and they're sick for decades. So if you begin to play with the numbers, 5 to 10 percent of 40 million people, you see it's a big deal. And so preventing this problem becomes much more important. Now, I want to tell you two drug approaches that we've taken to prevent traveler's diarrhea. The first was uh, Pepto-Bismol. It's interesting that in 1974, the U.S. Drug Administration said over-the-counter drugs should work. 1974, over-the-counter drugs should work. That was in 74. Before that, they didn't care if over-the-counter drugs worked or not, as long as they were safe. Well, we started testing Pepto-Bismol, and lo and behold, it was a pretty interesting drug. If you look at the percentage of, 
of students in Mexico in the placebo group that develop traveler's diarrhea and look at the group taking uh, Pepto-Bismol, you see that it was 65% protection rate. We tested a non-absorbed rifamycin antibiotic, rifaximin, which is entirely safe. No studies have ever identified a single side effect of this antibiotic, which is not absorbed. And taking one dose, two doses, or three doses a day, it was even more effective, over 70% effective in preventing traveler's diarrhea compared to the placebo control population. So we had drugs that worked very well. Uh, wh when I say 70% protection rate, what I mean is 70% of the case of cases of illness that would develop don't develop. And this is about the level of efficacy of most of the vaccines that we use in, uh, in medicine, is around 70%. And so taking one pill of rifaximin a day is as effective as many of the vaccines that we use in infectious diseases. Now, we've gotten involved with vaccines. An early vaccine developed in Sweden was taking the whole Vibrio cholera cells and adding it to recombinant binding subunit of cholera toxin, which is essentially identical to the toxin of entrotoxigenic E. coli, the principal cause of travelers' diarrhea. And our group and others have tested this vaccine, giving it in two oral doses, and it's between 52 and 67 percent effective in preventing travelers' diarrhea uh, during short-term stays. It is now commercially available in 50 countries of the world, not the United States, but in Canada and most European countries. The most recent vaccine that we've been working with is a patch. You it's an LT, a heat labile toxin of E. coli patch. You put it on the skin, and the antigen is absorbed through the Langerhan cells in the skin, and you develop a very significant immune response to the antigen. And lo and behold, in a phase two clinical trial carried out in Mexico and Guatemala that I was uh, the principal investigator on, found that this patch vaccine, two applications, was 76% effective in preventing moderate and 84% effective in preventing severe traveler's diarrhea. Not just intratoxigenic E. coli diarrhea, but traveler's diarrhea. Now, a phase three trial is, un, is, is now currently taking place in, uh, among uh, European travelers to Asia. And Dr. Zhidong Zhang, who is here, will be one of the principal uh, uh, individuals doing the microbiology for this very large clinical trial. But we, we, we do believe this vaccine will be available probably in the next year or two uh, and it's, uh, the, the biggest side effect is a little skin rash right under that where that patch goes. Now, I'm going to close with bringing some travelers to you, if you don't mind. It's one thing to sit in Houston and say preventing 70% of travelers' diarrhea is, is valuable. It's another thing to actually see travelers and see what they would do if they were sick. And I'm going to show you a progressive story of more urgent need to prevent diarrhea. And you'll, we'll get you warmed up, and you'll, you'll sort of see it with some easy cases. So the question I have, is it important to prevent diarrhea? We've got drugs. We will have vaccines that will prevent more than 60% of the cases. All right, now here's a group in, uh, in Cozumel, scuba diving, snorkeling. Uh, is it okay for them to get sick? I mean, after all, you could say diarrhea uh, lowers cholesterol, keeps the weight under control, <laughs> and just let them, let them get sick. Well, I want to tell you that diarrhea and a wetsuit is a bad combination, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. So, so we don't want that person to be sick. Well, let's get progressively more uh, serious. What about this guy in a Cairo medical meeting in the middle seat in an auditorium in Cairo? Is it okay for this guy to be sick? We've got things to prevent the disease. 
Okay, it's going to get worse. How about this young lady in the middle seat of a plane going across the Pacific Ocean? Do you know how big the Pacific Ocean is? <laughs> now she's in the middle seat. Thankfully, the guy on the aisle moved. <laughs> but look, there's a line to the bathroom. If she's got bad diarrhea, what is she going to do? Now, can you imagine that I would have something worse than these? Get ready. This is worse than all of these put together. Here's a woman in a game park in Africa, gotten out of the bus because she's got diarrhea. Look what's coming right behind her. We may never see her again because of her traveler's diarrhea. So anyway, we've published recommendations on who to give prophylaxis to. Those with unstable medical conditions, congestive heart failure, insulin-dependent diabetics, cancer patients, patients with inflammatory or irritable bowel syndrome uh, would be candidates. Critical trips that cannot tolerate even an eight-hour illness. These are lecturers, politicians, athletes, musicians, honeymoon couples. We can come up with lots of reasons why you can't tolerate an eight to 12-hour illness and this very important group of visiting friends and relatives. These are individuals who were born in India, Ethiopia, moved as kids to the United States, and now are going home to live with family and friends. Very high rate of disease in that population. Somebody who's had a, a bout of diarrhea before. Diarrhea is hereditary. It runs in your genes. G-E-N-E-N-S and J-E-A-N-S, okay? And finally, the wishes of the traveler. If they wish to have protection, we, uh, groups of people who have debated this thing think they should be able to have, uh, have this. I end this with just uh, introducing this. Maybe this is not something you've uh, uh, learned about before or known about. And I'm just going to show you one slide. My wife Peggy is here, who is involved in these projects with us, uh, with our team, is here with me in Mexico with a couple of medical students working on our project. We've taken more than 200 students from the University of Texas with us over the years. Peggy and I wrote the first book on how to stay healthy when you travel, which was published in 1981, uh, which really uh, is, was a beginning uh, of the field of travel medicine, which is now a bona fide discipline with an organization and with its own journal. And that uh, concludes my comments on Traveler's Diarrhea. Thank you.